Hi, I'm Ben Furman. And I'm Nate Blyton. This is Patch In, the show from SoundNotion.tv dedicated to the wonderful world of electroacoustic music. So let's start with some news items. Moog's Theremini is finally out, and I finally have it uh, next to my hot little hands. Uh, it's awesome. It is everything I had hoped for. You can absolutely turn off the pitch correction and have nothing but pure glissandos using the Animoog engine. Uh, the only problem I have with it is that I drink way too much coffee, so my hands are constantly going between pitches. Yeah. It's the hazards of theremin players everywhere. Um, we've got some news from the uh, Worldwide Developers Conference from Apple. Um, it's a, a, a crazy amount of new features out from, from their products, but uh, as they prep the release of OS X, it's 10.10 .10 now, y Yosemite. And uh, there's... For, yeah, and then the iOS hybrid is, is is going nuts and everything. iOS 8 is announced, steals the best of Android. <laughs> All the uh, some work with keyboards and widgets and lets iOS apps and talk and interact with each other, which is a pretty interesting development. Um, also, it's buying Beats Audio. It's, uh, the, we're going to see some exciting developments in their streaming service, hopefully, out of this. And also, you know, of course, selling overpriced headphones to teenagers. Right. Um, as those of you who watch the show know, uh, Nate and I are Kickstarter junkies. Mm -hmm. uh, we like to support interesting projects. And there is a new one out that I just found out about. Uh, Important Records is kickstarting a re-release of Pauline Oliveros's extremely influential uh, release, Reverberations. Uh, the original was on 12 records. Uh, this will be slightly... Fewer than that, hopefully, in CDs. Um, if you're not familiar with Oliveros, uh, you can find a ton of her stuff up on Ubu Web, and Wikipedia has a lot of links to her, as does YouTube. Um, she is easily one of the most important uh, electroacoustic composers and one of the uh, greatest uh, female composers of the 20th and 21st century. Um, that said, if you're also looking for other female electroacoustic composers, uh, Amazon has a lot, including uh, BBC badass Daphne Oram's uh, Oram tapes. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Oram was a sound engineer for the BBC and composer and did a lot of very, very interesting work with a synthesizer that she made where you would actually draw out the waveforms on clear magnetic uh, size tape and then photo sensors would track what you had drawn and convert that into pitch. Uh, there's also music from Lori Spiegel and Suzanne Ciani among many others. Uh, and that actually is a great way to introduce our featured guest. So we are joined today by Kirsten Volnes, uh, composer, professor, Boston New Music Initiative director member, uh, member of Hotel Elephant, and an amazing composer. So, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. All right. So, um, tell us about the Boston New Music Initiative. Well, when I first moved to Providence about five years ago, I was trying to find you know people to work with and things to do in this area. And I saw a call for scores for this new group called the Boston New Music Initiative. Um, and they ended up performing one of my pieces in their first concert. And I really liked the approach they were taking. They wanted to, you know, it was about facilitating new music happening. So they were giving opportunities to both com composers and performers and just trying to build a community. Because uh, there's a lot of new music going on in Boston, mm -hmm. but just means a means of connecting those disparate groups. They're often tied to academic institutions. Um, I thought it was a good way to get involved, and it's been a really wonderful experience since. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Now, among the other things that you're involved with, though, is Hotel Elephant. Right. Um, which I know Nate is familiar with and I am familiar with, and they do some absolutely amazing things. So how did you get involved with them? Well, I knew Mary Kuyum Jun from a previous project I did with the Redshift Ensemble. We both had written pieces for them using uh, wildlife field recordings from the Arctic made by Kathy Turco. She's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I met Mary through that and had mutual friends. 
And when they started up this new music ensemble, they really wanted to. Oh, sorry, my cat's moving. Uh, <laughs> Speaking of nature sounds, <laughs> right. Pluto's helping today. Uh-huh. Um, he, yeah, I mean, they just asked me to be part of the ensemble, and I've been working with them ever since. Mm-hmm. Even from Providence, which is pretty amazing, a testament yeah. to their uh, organizational abilities to get all these people into one room at the same time. That's wonderful. So, and, and you're active in the group as a, as a pianist, from what I understand. And then, right. uh, but then you've also been composing for them now. Yep. Uh, they commissioned a piece from me from, for last season. Uh, the theme of the season was light and dark. So they commissioned a piece from me and Richard Carrick um, to be premiered on their season opener. So I wrote them a 25-minute song cycle that involves mostly the whole band um, and our singer Caitlin McKechnie is an amazing, like really deep, low mezzo soprano. And unfortunately she wasn't able to sing the premiere, but Megan Schubert was an amazing person to work with instead. Um, but the vocal part goes really, really low to like the D below middle C. Yeah. So, real, real mezzo. It was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Written with a specific person in mind, but it worked out great. That's wonderful. Yeah. And I, I know that piece in particular has, uh, um, like there's electronics going the whole time as well. Um, do you, yeah. do you end up doing that live when, when performing the piece? Or is... A lot of times I will do the electronics ahead of time and really mm-hmm. produce them to the exact final state that I want them to be in. Cause I'm kind of a control freak like that. Yeah. Um, but then I end up triggering a lot of things in max or I'll have some live delay or something really simple on various voices. Yeah. To- yeah how it all lines up. Right. And that's something that I think goes throughout uh, every composer that we've talked to is the, the idea of control and being completely uh, prepared in advance for the electronic piece. So how do you find that works when you're working with live performers where there's so many variables of tempo and uh, if they're going to maybe make a cut at the last minute that you have to account for? Well, I try to write the piece in such a way that it can be flexible. Um, a lot of times there will be breaks where things don't need to line up completely until a certain point, and then it'll, there'll be a clear audio cue where you can reset your position in time. Uh, other times it's very rhythmic, so the electronics give enough of a pulse that you can play along with it as though it were a drummer or something. Yeah. Uh, and other times I just really try to make it not exact. <laughs> like there's room for them to be expressive in the way that they play things, and it doesn't have to line up perfectly to still be accomplish what I want it to accomplish. Yeah, that's an important thing to be flex- remain flexible. Like I mean, because humans can make those kind of decisions all the time of like, well, yeah, we'll kind of stretch this a little bit. And if you're playing with fixed media, then that's definitely a thing. I, I noticed it seemed like a couple of your performers had click tracks or or something. Yeah. Definitely. For the Hotel Elephant show, it was just safer that way. I think it was like, a, um, especially for David playing the piano intro at the beginning, yeah. it's really hard to hear in a big room with the speakers, yeah. you know, so I just, it was sort of more of a comfort thing for them than a necessity. But I try to avoid it when I can, like if it's <laughs> free floating enough that you can just play as though it were another person, then that's the ideal. But Yeah, I suppose like having a click track in your ear, that's like at least one ear of you not necessarily listening as well to your instrument that you're using or, or yeah. the, other, the other humans around and everything. Um, in your experience playing with the group, like have you uh, done a lot of pieces with electronics or, or come across that kind of working with fixed media as a performer in that setting as well? or? Yeah, Mary has had a few pieces that have a continual tape part, and a lot of times there's a click track for her work because it, sometimes it's more washy and um, almost cinematic, I guess is how I would describe the sure. electronic parts. It's more atmospheric. And so a lot of times there's really no way to tell whether or not you're with it unless yeah. <laughs> you have a click track. Right. And then other times, it's, you know, we have a conductor to help us too, so only one person has to be distracted by the clicking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She's really great at doing that, so... Now, that kind of raises an issue um, for me. Do you feel that you lose anything when you use the click track? Um, I mean, I think you lose a little freedom. You have to obviously be able to play the piece at tempo. Sometimes that's been 
something I've come across where mm. performers get a little stressed out because they have to actually play it at 144. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, for the first performance, sometimes that can be hard. Um, but they always rise. I feel like they always rise to the challenge. And even this, I just had a performance recently in Providence of a cello and percussion and electronics piece. And that tape part, I actually um, created using recording a cellist just playing this melody. And I didn't use a click when I recorded her specifically because I wanted it to feel natural and musical. And so when it ends up happening, you know, when the performers actually play with what she played on the tape, it's not exactly in time. And so I have to warn them that it kind of pulls ahead here or pulls, you know, holds back in other places. Right. So so they have to try to follow that and just feel it out. Um, Yeah. Otherwise, matching a click track to an existing performance that goes all over the place with tempo, that can be that can be a bear of work for sure. Definitely. Quite distracted, probably. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. right. Exactly. (laughs) Maybe not the most. Yeah, go ahead, Ben. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that segues into um, another thing about your music um, that I've noticed for uh, several years now. Um, You are the first person we found on the show who is explicitly and unabashedly melodic in how they write. Mm -hmm. Uh, We've had a lot of composers on here who get very into rhythm, but are still somewhat out there in the ether in terms of pitch space. But uh, you write very lyrically and melodically. Um, how, how do you see that in the world of electroacoustic music? Well, I once had a conversation with a teacher who will remain nameless about how electronic music <laughs> didn't have the same qualities that other music did. Like you can't, it doesn't have themes. It doesn't have, um, I don't know, counterpoint and all these other things. And I guess I feel that when I'm writing electroacoustic music, it, I don't approach it any differently than I would approach a wind quintet or something mm-hmm. where you don't have the sound palette, like the, you know, the vast sound palette that you're given when making electronic music. Mm-hmm. And so I think that growing up listening to pop music and, you know, like I always talk about Stevie Wonder because I really think he had a huge impact on me as a three-year-old. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> but I feel <laughs> like that music is so ingrained deeply in me that I couldn't escape melody if I wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I, I think some other pieces become textural at times, but there's always some linear aspect of this through line and a breath voice that continues. Mm-hmm. I, I was watching some of the uh, behind the scenes videos of uh, as you were in progress of re- rehearsing Precious Nothing. And um, I noticed you mentioned Stevie Wonder and popular music and everything. And uh, you in this video, you said that there's a good chunk of the piece like, um, in the middle. I know that uh, that is basically a pop song. <laughs> and uh, and uh, Ben and I and most of the people involved in our podcasting group, uh, we're all like kind of mixed between popular and, and different kinds of musicians. Um, do you end up uh, like performing in a popular context at all? Or, or do you find... I, and more specifically, between the <laughs> pop pop music land and classical music land, you feel like there's a an approach to electronics that you you find that you like use from either world or bring across to the classical world, or what's that yeah. relationship like for you? Uh, definitely, I feel like I I would like to live in a world where classical world and pop world don't really have boundaries, you know. Yeah, what I, mean? right. <laughs> yes. I feel like a lot of the music I write can live in either one of them at any given time. And um, I think electronics have been a big way of opening the door to that, uh, having that as an option, because you can be a lot louder, you can spatialize things, you can use um, just amplification in general, I think, yeah. a lot. Um, but there's also something very magical about someone who has spent 20 some years trying to learn their instrument to the best of their ability and the f- kind of ama- like amazing electric experience you can get out of any performer really who's an incredible musician. So I think um, if I go to a new music concert or even an old music concert that's a little too classical stuffy for me, I feel it. I feel like I'm a little bit restricted yeah. in my experience. Sure. So, um, I, I've been playing in a band, so to speak, of, it's a group called Meridian Project, and we write music collectively, you just start with an improvisation, and all of it is inspired by physics, 
um, one of our shows was exploring new research in dark matter detection. We have a friend who just graduated from Brown University in their physics department who yeah. worked on one of those detectors a mile underground in South Dakota. And so okay. he wrote this lecture and we set it to music and had, you know, an entire evening length performance pairing the two. Um, so we wrote a lot of music for that. And I feel like that experience is a lot more band like for me or even um, more of a jazz kind of experience than a classical experience. Yeah, for sure. And I like having that in my life. And even um, I do a lot of work with this group called the Tenderloin Opera Company, which is okay. a advocacy group. And we meet once a week and do writing exercises with people who have either experienced homelessness or are currently homeless um, and just random people from the community who want to be involved. And so uh, we eventually put a play together with much help from Eric N., who's the playwriting professor at Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, we set that to music. So that whole community music experience I get working with that group also makes me feel like I'm taking what I've learned in the classical world and expanding it out into a larger, um, I guess, reaching a larger community with it is what's most important to me. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's something that I have uh, been experimenting a lot with personally uh, in the last couple of months is getting out of the concert hall and into different venues that people might not associate with new music or music in general. Mm -hmm. Um how do you see your audiences reacting to well, what you're doing? Yeah, I think that they've been all positive reactions. There's uh, the Planetarium show. We actually did another different new show at this observatory called Frosty Drew in southern Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And that was specifically for a meteor shower. So I feel like um, it's a great way to reach out. I feel like in new music especially, we need to build audience because yeah. there's – been a lot of <laughs> post World War II. It's been difficult, right? Yeah, um, right. The patrons all went away, and we had to figure something out. So, <laughs> I think <laughs> that it's important to find different ways to. I, I think actually, what's more important is that approaching your art as a means of sharing with more than just a small group of people who are just like you. Yeah. I think that's really important. So, finding ways to. Take your ideas, be expressive. You can be as narcissistic as you want about it, but finding some way of approaching the world with open arms and you know being welcoming about it and finding new opportunities to do so, I think it will really help everyone who's trying to live in the creative world today making work. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to, to hear your attitude about <laughs> about yeah. this, especially like having having you be an electronic musician among all the different kinds of musician that you are, um, it and so it's it's interesting to me talking about, um, I mean relating jazz and improvisation and uh, playing in a band kind of format, but also um, using this kind of technology that has uh, such a kind of. Uh, it, that can be directed in such a research institution kind of way. Um, and I, I, I was looking through uh, one of the courses that you teach is electroacoustic music composition. And um, just the, the listening list is, is really cool because it, it, uh, it's a nice uh, list for getting a, a good history of uh, American, European, and, and different kinds of, uh, of electronics and electric things used in, in music either with computers or without and um what, what's the i mean do you do you find that teaching and um and kind of uh, clearly maintaining this uh this tradition of electronic music and the academy and everything do you feel that that um still informs your work that you do or what what's it like being a teacher in addition to a composer performer I think it's very educational, actually, being a teacher. <laughs> it really makes me focus on what's important about what I'm doing and what, you know, the really clear points I want to get across to people are about whatever work we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, I think in that class, it doesn't show all the Nine Inch Nails I played. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'll examples, but, yes, um, Ghosts 1 through 4, <laughs> one of the most underrated albums in the history of music. Yeah, I mean... <laughs> and Trent Reznor definitely had some impact in the world of popular and classical music, I think. For yeah. sure. um, but I think I get so much out of it. I, just having 
they come up with the ideas I never would have thought of also. And I think there's a valuable resource in having a dialogue with people that you don't always get if you're just living in your little composer hut doing your thing. And, you know, sometimes you see performers, but being able to have these discussions over and over and over again um, and learn about new things you hadn't thought of or hadn't considered, I think there's always a surprise in every class I teach that I didn't expect. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And I mean, and and you talked about with one of the groups that you're uh, that you're um, working with, actually working with some hard data, <laughs> or or where in the sense that, uh, or I, I guess I I didn't understand from what you said, you were um, doing music with a project that had some uh, data from <laughs> dark <laughs> matter research, yeah. Yeah. Dark the dark matter research, research. Yep. yeah. Were you um, actually using numbers from that? or is that No, we actually decided from the very beginning we weren't going to do any sort of sonification of data. <laughs> okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> the project. But uh, we ended up just taking concepts like the fact that only 5% of the known universe, the matter and energy that we are able to observe, that's as much as we can observe. So there's this whole other vastness that is beyond our observational uh, reach. And so we tried to show that in the music metaphorically, just based on density and um, the idea of planetary motion orbits going different speeds around the center, uh, the same gravitational center, like the sun. Uh, that one piece that we wrote just had polyrhythms and occasionally everything would line up again. And when it did, we would change pitches so you could actually hear the process somehow. Okay. Um, and, you know, the concept that... that these things called WIMPs, which are weakly interacting massive particles that they believe exist as the foundation of dark matter itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, that these particles don't interact with anything. Very, very rarely do they interact, which is what they're looking for underground. And so just this idea that we keep missing each other musically forever and ever until finally it lines up and something magical happens. Um, so it was, it was more metaphorical concepts that we were drawing yeah. upon. I think there's, <laughs> I, we, we've uh, talked about using numbers in, in, uh, in music and sonify, so, so doing sonification of different data and stuff and how sometimes that can be successful, sometimes that can be a little bit tricky to kind of work with. And I think the approach that you had is wonderful where it actually gets the, the kind of meaning behind it a little bit. Um, and uh, speaking of which, we, we, uh, we came across another one of your pieces. It's called River Rising uh, for Violin and Electronics. Um, could, could you talk a little bit about this piece? It is really interesting to listen to. Sure. This piece is interesting. Usually when I'm writing pieces for live instrument and electronics, I'll work on a little bit of one side of things, maybe the live part, and then a little bit of the electronics. And as it goes, they'll inch along side by side until eventually the piece is finished. Mm -hmm. um, in this case, I wrote the tape part fully all the way through because I really, I really okay. wanted the violin part to have to ride the wave, so to speak, like yeah. be uh, just this surface texture on top of everything else that was happening or be sucked into it somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so the metaphor of the whole water flood thing was very present from the very beginning in the process that I undertook to make this. So... I recorded a whole lot of accordion samples and <laughs> produced the whole tape part and then ended up writing the violin line after the fact. And so I, I feel the piece is very, you know, could be very improvisatory. I try to leave a lot of space for different um, opportunities to ornament things or there are these weird little tremolo that come in and out only when the performer decides to do them. So um, I wanted to leave a lot of freedom for the performer to play it however they want and even improvise beyond what I've written, because I sort of feel like what I wrote was just an improvisation anyway. Whatever, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know? <laughs> now, so has, it's something like that. Yeah. Has that been an issue with performances? Um, I've seen a lot of uh, performers who are afraid to improvise unless they've taken jazz courses, and string players in particular. Oh, definitely. I mean, the woman who performed it recently, just the premiere, was very to the book, you know, didn't want to make the ugly sounds either on the violin, which I understand. Right. <laughs> but uh, Olga was amazing, but very shy about, you know, didn't want to go too crazy. 
And I think it worked out okay. I actually hear what my version of it is when they only play what's written on the paper, which is okay. But I think I just wanted to leave it open for those who are more adventurous and want to go crazy with it. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, maybe, I mean, as with working with these humans who've practiced their instrument for so long and everything, often their knowledge and experience can can potentially help a piece. And, and it's nice to... Yes have that attitude and it's uh it's interesting the way you describe uh the process you went through it along uh, and its relationship with the metaphor of having this fixed media that like <laughs> their the relationship with it is kind of like it's yeah being swept along and and everything it's it's wonderful um well and that touches on another thing which is that as composers we always bring our own experiences to the table when we're writing a piece. I mean, it's unavoidable. Um, with that in mind, uh, I would like to ask, uh, as a woman composer, how has that influenced your work and what has been your experience uh, working in what's generally stereotyped as being a male dominated field? Well, I think, I mean, I've always had female role models from the very beginning. My first composition teacher was a woman, Judith Lang Zamont. And so as a student, I never really noticed that I was a female and that was weird. And then I guess after graduate school, things were still pretty evenly matched, if not weighted more toward women actually at Michigan, which is interesting. Um, and my electronic music TAs were both women, so that was helpful too. Um, but I feel like, you know, if I go to a conference since, I guess the first conference I went to was maybe in 2004 and it really hit me hard that first time I walked into one of those rooms, just the white male gray hair everywhere <laughs> <laughs> and Funny everyone shirt. came up and talked to me because they were like, who are you? Strange female young person, you know? Um, and so sometimes I feel like it has given me. I mean, I guess I, a clear advantage, I won this prize in 2007 called the Women's, BMI Women's Music Commission. So in that sense, yeah. I actually, I think, have benefited in that particular instance from just being in a smaller pool. Yeah. But uh, overall, I mean, these days I'm kind of sad that it hasn't, that equality and the evenly matched population that I found in graduate school has not translated past graduate school to the real world. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you know, blind submissions would help this process at all. So people's identities are completely, you know, kept hidden while people are choosing their. Um, I think the more I can be an activist and teacher and try to encourage other women and not white males to be involved with this would be great. I think it's also in music and the arts in general, it's also a socioeconomic issue. Yes. If you don't have music in schools, you don't have that opportunity necessarily. Because as music teachers, we all want to get paid something we can live on, too. Yeah. So it's like this cycle <laughs> that will cycle upon itself until something changes. So um, there's a group in Providence that just started this year called Open Signal, mm. if you haven't heard about it. they uh, Caroline Park and Asha Tamir Sira. I can't say her name, sorry. Uh, she, They both started this performance series of female electronic musicians and they had a big festival in May um, and I think the more people talk about the situation and the fact that there are women out there doing work and finding ways to get them involved whether it's on your Boston Symphony Orchestra concert list or your you know especially the institutions I think need to lead the way in being more representative so yeah, but I think uh, it's just my own work. I try to avoid thinking about it. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to write the music. I'm going to write either way. So right, you've got plenty of ideas yeah. to work with besides the gender <laughs> thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> right. What you said though about uh, access is really interesting to me. Um, you know, living in Lansing, Michigan, um, I've been watching as they've essentially cut arts out of the public school curriculum pretty much entirely at the elementary school level. Uh, but on top of that, there's uh, similar issues of gender and uh, race in the hard sciences as well, which they are, in fact, trying to address and to try and have programs that uh, encourage uh, women and anyone who's not a white male uh, to go into computer programming or the hard sciences. Uh, but at the same time, these programs are so young that there's no way to tell if they're having any real effect yet, that these kids are still 10, 
11 years outside of even thinking about going to college. Mm -hmm. um, so in talking about the institutions leading the way, um, what do you see would be the best way for them to lead the way in this? Well, I was more thinking of programming of composers, for instance. Um, if you run a music ensemble, think about whose music you're representing when you put on a concert. I mean, that could be as simple as playing Pauline Olivero's piece. I mean, it doesn't have to be. Yeah, right. it's, there are plenty of older established composers that are women, too. I think sometimes people are shy, just in general, too, about orchestras where everywhere and, um, I guess, opera companies. It's just important to think about what segment of the population you're wanting to represent in the work that you're presenting. Mm -hmm. And as far as institutions go, I think it's important to just encourage creativity, I think, first and foremost, because I came to music composition from creative writing, mostly. Mm -hmm. I was more of a poet and fiction writer first in high school. And I played music a lot, but I was always kind of shy about it and didn't want to try that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, it just felt a little too personal for me as a teenager. So I would write my little poetry and that was safer because you'd read it over there and I wouldn't, you know, be sitting here while you're, you know, you're reading it. Um, but I think that's really what got me interested. Just this feeling of agency. You have something to share that's interesting. And so I think having creativity in your science class or your math class or, you know, whatever it is, is very important as a means of promoting the arts in general, too. Now, on the subject of poetry, um, that raises a really interesting uh, question. Um, I am terrified of having to write my own lyrics. <laughs> Have you ever done that? And what is your experience with writing and setting lyrics? Well, uh, I haven't really done my own singer-songwriter thing where I write the lyrics and the music together. Mm -hmm. But I have edited some text from other public domain poetry to better fit the music when I need to, or, you know, very small edits, so nothing major. But um, I worked really closely with my friend and playwright, Adara Myers, on the third movement of the Precious Nothing song cycle. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a really excellent experience. And all that stuff I learned in poetry class actually paid off a lot because, um, you know, she would write these incredible lyrics and I would sing through them and just wait until there was one line that I couldn't figure out the music for. And I knew that one just had to be adjusted a little bit or reworded somehow. And so, um, that's basically how it worked. I would circle one and be like, this needs to either go or change. <laughs> and then we would yeah. work it out together, <laughs> but right. it didn't take long. Actually. I think maybe the second or third draft was the final draft. Of the oh, wow poem <laughs> so um she's on my wavelength i think it worked out really well nice nice yeah my few attempts at writing lyrics for my own pieces uh have been the type of thing that you would expect to see a really depressed teenager write on their live <laughs> journal page yeah right yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah. i don't go near that anymore <laughs> Yeah. Um, I was actually wondering about this. Uh, in Precious Nothing, you, there is a pre-recorded track and also some live electronics happening. And I noticed a couple spots where uh, the mic in particular had some delay. And I was wondering if there was um, any particular relationship you were trying to explore between the electronics and the text. Yes, the definitely. Um, that is in the second movement, Dream Song. Mm -hmm. And the text is actually written, it's a children's poem written by Walter de la Mer, and it, it's just going through this list of different kinds of light, and it starts to go off into this kind of fantasy land where they're yeah. talking about elf light and, you know, toads and all these things. Um, and just the fantasy aspect of it, I really wanted the music to sort of go out there too. Mm -hmm. And so things start to fragment and this delay comes in just to make it feel a little bit more supernatural and disconnected from reality. So that's, I think, how the text influenced that particular use of electronics. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Rather reminds me of uh, Thea Musgrave's Narcissus, the, the, the open pool and how they use delay in a similar way that way. Yep. Um, yeah. I, um, I, I guess I, I wonder, like, are, 
so you've uh, we've seen examples of you using uh, live electronics doing processing, different kinds of modulation on an instrument, and using that in tandem and in conjunction with uh, preset kind of audio and everything. Um, is there any kind of electronic work that you're that you have like been interested in doing but haven't gotten the chance to put in a piece yet or something like that? Or well, I'm always interested. I, f I feel like the control freak in me doesn't trust a completely, you know, um, whether tracking notes or tracking timing or, you know, like this whole house of cards that comes with pro programming. Yeah, Sounds right. Wonderful. Plus the time it takes to make that, I feel like I would rather just do it with my Waves plug-in or whatever. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we also worked really hard on that programming. Yeah, so I know it's currently on sale at wavesaudio.com, yeah, no exactly. doubt. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think just I've done a I did a piece recently with a couple of friends that involved an art museum at the University of Texas at Austin and turning it into a sort of instrument where the dancers movement would control the effects on the musicians who are playing in a completely different room into microphones. Yeah. Uh, and then the music would come out in a completely different space where the audience was surrounded by speakers which would then be panned by the trombone player as he wandered around his little room. So just <laughs> complicated things like that. I'm glad to have other people to help me with because I don't, I don't know. I don't live and breathe to program stuff. So no. that's something that I would love to explore more, but yeah. it requires time that I don't have right now. <laughs> so, yeah. And it um, can be a deep and un yeah. unfortunately dark rabbit hole to dive into as well. And, and yes. like, yeah, and sometimes e it it can be easy to lose sight of some of the compositional ideas that it, True. it sounds like you're so so good at achieving. I feel like I definitely let the artistic idea drive the technology that I use and yeah. the choices I make to best represent it. So uh, I haven't built any amazing, I don't know, shoe controllers or something that I don't <laughs> do it. But yeah, <laughs> it's something I'm interested in for sure. Well, um, it, I guess then compositionally, like, uh, what's next for you? Are you, do you, do you have any pieces down the line that you're interested in working on there? Yeah. Um, I started writing this kind of goofy set of cabaret songs about female ser serial killers. <laughs> and they're all from like the 19th century and they're kind of funny. So I guess that's a sort of feminist piece I'm writing, uh, <laughs> but I need to finish the other two movements. I haven't done that yet. So I think I'm actually at a point right now where I can do whatever I want for a little while. I have mm -hmm. a nice little break for the summer. Um, so right. I might just do a few goofy pieces that I've been waiting to do for a while. So is this going to be uh, Lizzie Borden, the musical? Oh, there will be a Lizzie Sweet Borden movement for sure. Yeah. Okay. She's <laughs> Her house is not far from here, so. <laughs> it's wonderful. Nice. Um, do you have anything coming up that you would like to uh, let our listeners know about? Sure. Um, on Saturday, my piano and electronics piece, Nocturne, will be performed at the New York Electroacoustic Music Festival. Um, it'll also be performed on June 22nd at the Maison Music Festival at the Tenry Cultural Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, they're having a long new music marathon that day from 4 p.m. till like 10 p.m., I think. Um, I'm also playing a John Luther Adams piece at the Q2 Meet the Composer launch party on June 24th with Hotel Elephant. Okay, yeah. Nice. Um, and I think there's one more thing. July 6th, my wind quintet will be performed by the Washington Square Winds in New York. Okay, wonderful. Okay. That's all I know about so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um nocturne of course i've seen performed at uh seamus uh, yeah. actually you were playing the piano on that one so uh it was a great piece i highly recommend that if you have a chance and you're in the area that you go out and hear that one uh it's a very very lovely piece yeah actually i have one other thing i wanted to ask you about that i, I forgot to do earlier in the show um i noticed in watching the video of precious nothing i uh, that in addition to having uh, wires running to everybody or a couple of the people for click tracks and stuff, there were mics all over the place. Mm -hmm. And uh, was that just for amplification of the piece in the hall? Is that, is that what that was for? It was for recording and for amplification. At okay. Roulette, they usually amplify everybody. So Okay, yeah. Just and, a better, it's really hard to hear the strings in that room for whatever reason. So I think it's also just to help balance in the boomy space. 
Yeah. Um, did you end up putting together that recording yourself uh, from the mic feeds that they had and stuff? Or? Yeah. Cool. So uh, it's uh, it's an interesting thing to me, uh, like doing kind of a direct close miking of a live performance and getting to go through that process of mixing it and placing mm -hmm. everybody in the stereo field and everything. How How was that working on that recording? It was okay. I think I would have spent more time on it if I had more time. I had a deadline yeah. to finish, but um, and I haven't gone back to it yet. But I feel like they did a good job of, you know, the, their general placing of mics and everything was pretty clear. So it was, it wasn't that difficult to adjust, make slight adjustments in various places for yeah, different great. things it I wanted to stick out. Yeah, in terms of quality of mics, they certainly Neumann certainly had a strong showing on the stage there. I think. <laughs> yes, yeah. it did. It was pretty great. Yeah, yeah, that's a nice thing. Um, there was one mic kind of in the foreground of the picture that almost looked like it was pointing at the speaker or something like that. I, I was curious about what that was, but um, I don't know. I it's off. Well, <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll send you a message about it later or something, but. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a it's an interesting project, and uh, <laughs> and I I know me personally as a composer, audio engineer person. Like I've got so many backlog projects of like love to go back to that Pro Tools session and really mix in detail work on that and everything. But Definitely. yeah, do you, I mean like. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I haven't, I haven't looked for too many of your recordings or anything like that. Do you, have, you, have you done that of recording your own music and, and, and releasing a whole album kind of thing? Or? Yeah, I mean, I haven't released albums simply because yeah. I feel like the quality hasn't been as much as, you know, I want it to be even better in a nice, quiet studio and everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I think as far as, you know, uh, just a channel of live performances, I think they've all been fairly well recorded. It just depends on the situation. Yeah. But I, every chance I get, I'll try to get a close mic on somebody. Yeah. So I can mix it later. Yeah. It's Definitely. It's totally a good way to go. Well, I... All right. <laughs> ben, were you going to say something? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I think we're, we're pretty close to, I guess, wrapping up the show. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us in this time. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for for doing the <laughs> for letting us know what you've got coming up. And I hope you have yeah. a wonderful time with uh, the writing, writing a couple of fun pieces in your in your break. So I assume this is a break away from teaching and stuff. Correct. Yeah, I'm figuring out what I'm doing with the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, this is always yep. summer mode for composers, yeah. right? <laughs> yep, definitely. Well, thank you so much for having me. Yep. Yeah. And now, of course, it is time for our infamous two-minute challenge. Uh, every month, we go over a crazy electroacoustic topic in two minutes or less. And this month, Nate, it is your turn. One, one topic I should point out that is not possible to explain in two minutes. Right, exactly. <laughs> yes. So we're going to do a general overview kind of sampling of what it exactly means to be an audio interface in, in these to days. To be an audio like, interface. Be an, <laughs> it's like a Buddhist thing. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what, exa what really is an audio interface? You know? Are How you can ready? An audio interface be more audio interface -y? All right. I um, see a counter up there. Yeah. <laughs> so we're queued up and... Uh, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm ready to go. When you're ready, go for it. Okay. So why is an audio interface? Or what is an audio interface? Or how is an audio interface? It's all these things. I don't know if you... Are uh, you one? Yeah, exactly. Do you find yourself being an audio interface sometimes? So in my time as an electronic musician and recording person, I've collected a couple different ones. So I've got... Nice. I'm Audio 410, fo Focusrite guy, another Focusrite, Mo2. Um... For this show, I'm using a, a little recorder as uh, this is my means of getting my microphone into my computer. Um, for, and uh, there's, there's so many different ways that you can uh, get sound in and out of a, some kind of computing device. And the, the game has changed wildly with mobile applications and everything as well. But the key things that you need are some way to get audio in and audio out. 
uh, I grew up with a computer that had two little eighth inch jacks and, <laughs> you know, and I could, I could plug my mixer in and get my preamp going in in doing the different uh, digital analog conversion. But um, I want to break this down kind of historically. So um, say I've got a microphone and it needs power. I might have a little phantom power box that would give the, the microphone the power it needs. I would need a preamp, a little rack mount unit or something that would get the level up to a, a good level where I could then send it into another box that would convert it from analog to digital information. And that would con connect into a computer either through another box that would actually do the con digital conversion um, or not. But, um, and say I wanted to connect with any kind of MIDI devices or anything, I would need another box for that. But we've got lovely boxes that do all of those things for like 150 bucks now. It's nuts. This, um, so at, at in future Two Minute Challenges, we're going to break down each of those things. But I just wanted to kind of talk about what audio interfaces are. <laughs> What do you think, Ben? Did he do it? Oh, I think he started to do it. Yeah, but exactly, that's right? It's going to take a couple <laughs> subsequent episodes to really get into. Yeah. Is it still a two minute challenge if you string two minutes together over several <laughs> months to make like a 10 minute explanation? Uh, maybe 20 minutes. I mean, I think I might be able to do ADC in 10 minutes. Yeah, a year long two minute Odyssey. Yeah, yeah. this is the, the two minute. Oh, hey, the Odyssey is a separate like... uh, episode. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. That was terrible. Sorry. But in any case, thank you for the opportunity. To let me try to talk about audio interfaces for a little while and stumble through it like I often do. Um, but this has been Patch In, our monthly show about electronic music and composition. Um, Kirsten Volnes, thanks again so much for coming on our show. And we look forward to everything that uh, that you've got coming up. Um, yeah, in I. Uh, if you want to see our shows or any uh, backlog of uh, our episodes, you can go to soundnotion.com or soundnotion.tv slash pi. Um, and at soundnotion.tv, you can see the rest of the network's shows. We've, uh, we've got the regular Sound Notion podcast and a, a bunch of other lovely things. You can support our show and the rest of our shows. We've got an Amazon affiliate link on on, or an Amazon search tool on the website as well as uh, spaces to do donations. But most of all, we'd love that you just listen to our show and thank you so much for listening or watching. Um, yeah, you can find us in the iTunes store or whatever podcatching device that you like. Um, yeah, thanks again. And uh, this has been Patchen. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Ben Furman. And, and we'll see you next month.